episode 46. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture. This is a show where we talk about the business side of architecture. Now, I know that you've mastered the art of architecture. This is where you can come to learn about the art of business. Today is our second episode with Kevin Costello. And Kevin, we had a great conversation last week about how he arrived in Arizona after getting a Master's of Architecture degree with uh, during the height of the Great Recession in 2009, he had a suitcase full of belongings, some money saved up in the bank, a dream, and a whole lot of hopes and aspirations. Like, I'm sure that's something we can all relate to. Now, last episode, we talked a little bit about how he was able to um, rehabilitate an old home and his his time basically searching uh, searching for a job and the interview process. I want to give a little bit of background about Kevin. Kevin is the chief designer at the Ranch Mine, and he has his business from 2010 to 2013. He's grown it 45% each year, and it's getting better and better every day. This year, they're on track to quadruple their business billings and in the process of hiring staff. So they are a national award-winning design firm. And they've recently been named Phoenix's best emerging creative duo, him and his partner, Claire. They made the Arizona Republic's top 13 under 35 entrepreneurs. And they've also had their work featured on the NBC's Today Show. So, Kevin, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. It is good having you. So last time we, we ended and you were talking a little bit about putting yourself out there and this has obviously helped you in your business. You know, mm-hmm. one thing you mentioned is about being proactive with the press. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you have to have good work to get exposure, but then you also have to reach out to people. And I just want to mention that you practice what you preach. This is what you did with me. You know, I got an email from you with a good description, a little hook about your story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you saw it from my perspective. Okay, Enoch, he probably wants good content. I have a good story. And, yep. you know, I'm going to get on his show. I'm going to get some extra exposure. And we all we all benefit. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really the way to look at it is if you look at it, um, you know, less selfishly, more selflessly and look at it, what what does someone else need for me? What can I can provide? Uh, what value can I provide to them is generally a better situation. You're more likely uh, to be published or to be on a podcast like this or or to do things like that. Yeah. So do you have any tips about let's talk a little bit about public relations and about sure. and about a little bit about self promotion because that's something that I know creative sometimes we struggle with that uh, getting out there and actually pushing our work. So you've been like I mentioned, you've been featured. You were chosen as one of Arizona Republic's top thirty five under thirty five entrepreneurs. Congratulations! Mm-hmm. Thank Had you. some of your work featured on the NBC's Today Show. Tell me, what's your process for reaching out to the media? Um, a lot of it, it depends on uh, what source we're looking at. So we don't have one sort of uh, you know, standardized way of which we can reach out because each sort of venue wants something different. So we look at it from a bunch of different ways. Um, as for the NBC Today show, we didn't actually reach out. They found our work when they were scouring uh, the internet. So that I can't really say. But for example, the entrepreneurs, 35 under 35, uh, they do a call for submissions. Uh, and what you fill out, uh, you know, questions on your finances and your business model and all that kind of stuff. And then why should we pick you? And so we filled that out and submitted that. So there are some things that are as simple and straightforward as that. Getting into the Arizona Republic or magazines or things of that source, we generally reach out, we read them. First of all, we, we find out what they're looking for in terms of the content and what sort of direction they're looking to go. And then we reach out to the author directly Um, because you'll typically find in a magazine or a newspaper that it's the same person writing over and over and they need to produce content. And that's a very difficult thing, as you know, with a podcast or, you know, a blog or anything that people are always looking for interesting content. Um, And so what we try to do is we don't push everything out there. We, We wait until we feel that we have a solid story 
um, and we help them write that story. Um, so we, you know, we write up a nice sort of thing of why we feel this would be great uh, for the publication, how it fits in, here's some images, we'd love to talk more and make it as simple as possible for them to publish our work. Excellent. That is a great idea. And, and it's worked. I mean, the email that you sent me, I, I had never met you before, but I'm going to, let's see, it's one, two, three. I mean, you have about seven or eight paragraphs here where you told me about your whole story and you obviously, you know, made it interesting so that I would have some validation here that, you know, you're the real deal. And, um, because, you know, if you don't know someone, you don't know them. So very true. So we've given, so we've given their roadmap to people who want to reach out to the media, you know, let, let's go back to talk a little bit about building the business about you've already, you're more honest, you have, you're getting some cash flow, mm -hmm. starting to put in some systems. Yep. Now it's time to develop the business and to actually look at a growth plan. How are you going to manage this business as it grows? Right. So yeah, when we, you know, after our first few projects, when we started to make a little bit of money, not much, um, the first thing that we did, which was very difficult at the time because we had very little money was invest in a website. Um, we spent about 80% of the money that we had earned up to that date very early on after just our second, I believe, second project um, on our website because um, we knew that if we were going to get more work, we need to have at least a professional looking website. Um, so that was one of the big things. And, and it's also a big risk, you know, when you don't have work coming in the door to invest so much of your business's money. But we saw that as a long term investment, knowing that, OK, we can use this website and we'll set it up for, you know, being able to use it for multiple years. Let's do it now and do it right so that we can get the right projects to move forward. So I think that was really the big first step after our first few projects. Um, and then uh, from there, it was really, um, you know, just uh, creating interesting work um, and, and getting the right kind of jobs. Okay. So let's, you know, something interesting. One thing that after, after doing enough of these interviews that I've seen is that one thing that tends to hold architects and just business people back in general is not being able, not being willing to invest in their business because they don't see it as an investment. They might see it as a cost. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, with the website, you you showed a lot of wisdom, I think, in the way you just described it, how you saw it as a long-term play. Sure, it's going to be a huge sacrifice, and yeah. I don't know if I would have taken that risk, you know, to spend that much money up front, but I think that says something else about your personality and about your partnership and what has made you, uh, your firm, successful. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's definitely a risk, but we we sort of... From the beginning, Claire, my partner, she was interested in business and entrepreneurship. And so we always have seen ourselves as risk takers and, you know, looked from more of the entrepreneurial than a traditional architecture type uh, of business. So, uh, I mean, for example, the third project that we did, which was our largest project, it was very difficult. We worked with an investor who wanted to do uh it was a 1,000 square foot house and he wanted to double the square footage and com the house was completely uh, had been stripped and abandoned for five years. So it was a huge project for us after doing some more interior remodel type stuff. And uh, we, to get the project, actually set up a fee structure in which we would only get paid based on a percentage of the money that the developer made off the project uh, to keep his risk considerably down because he didn't need to pay us much up front. And that most of our payment would become at the end of of the project, um, which is very difficult to do when you're not getting cash flow. Uh, but to be able to get to a project where we knew that we could then parlay that project into other projects of that scale, we knew that we had to um, invest some time and effort up front uh, to get that payoff at the end. Okay, so there's some people say, you know, I know especially if they're younger, they think there's always the issue of the architectural license. There's like, oh, well, I'm not a licensed, I don't have an architectural license, therefore, you know, I can't, I got to wait to do that. Mm -hmm. um, has that held you guys back at all? No. Um, I, I don't know if every state allows you to design single family residences without a license, but um, I heard, I think I heard New York doesn't, but in Arizona, you can, you can do single family residences without a license. Yep. Um, so it hasn't held us back and we've done a, a commercial property, uh, a bar that's also a movie theater. It's called Film Bar. 
um, we worked with an architect on that job. Um, so uh, that was a partnership with us. Um, so there, there's ways around it as well. You know, if you want to work with someone else and partner on a project uh, to be able to do larger stuff. Um, but I think, again, generally, you know, I worked at some firms in college. And so I knew roughly what I needed to do to get permits and that kind of stuff. But most of it's just kind of asking the right questions and, and just doing it. Yep. Yep. So you had this, this investor, I'm going to go back. You had this investor that you basically took an equity stake almost in the project and said, yep. listen, we'll, we'll take our fees on the back end. Mm -hmm. That was a big risk for your company, especially at a young, young state like that. Yeah, it was a huge risk uh, at that time. But at that time, again, this was so this was early twenty or late late twenty ten. Uh, I can't remember the year. Uh, but um, so it was early. Is our third third major project? We had done some bathrooms okay. and we had done two interior remodels. So this was our first major project. Wow. Um, and so we. And, and actually that, that film bar project was going on at the same time. So there was a little bit of cash coming in, not much. Um, but we knew that we needed to be able to do a project, you know, the catch 22 of how do you do something we've never done it before. We, so we needed to find out a creative way to be able to do a project of that magnitude to get to where we wanted to go. Um, and from that, actually, during that project, we booked our first custom client house based on one, our professional website, two, the clients loved our mission statement, and then three, they were seeing the plans and renderings and we were writing some blog posts about what we were doing on this other house. So even while we were proving our concept, we hadn't proved it yet, but while we were in the process, we were able to book a custom client during that in which we were able to get some more cash flow. Excellent. So you mentioned uh, the website being an investment. Were there any other rather large investments that you made in the business that paid off uh, and that you thought were good decisions? Hmm. Uh, we've kept it pretty lean. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had, you know, we had computers from from college. Sure. Uh, I guess I, I guess what I'm asking is, if someone's starting out and they have limited resources and they have to figure out, okay, we got to spend our money on something. Mm -hmm. You know, what would be your advice? Well, number one, I would say a website um, because at least from, from my experience, and I'm sure everyone's differs, but everyone goes online. Um, and I think most people look for work or architects or designers and that kind of stuff online. So if you don't have a strong web presence that says I'm a professional, then I think it's going to be very difficult to start off uh, unless you're getting referrals of friends and family. And that's typically, I think, how most residential architects or small firms or you know younger people start off doing a job for their parents or friends or family uh, through referrals. But if you want to get um, non-referral based jobs, then you have to have a solid website. Excellent. Well, I would I would invite those who are listening to go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash website. And on there, I actually have a tutorial of how they can use uh, a great web software, WordPress, to set up their own website that should get them through the, the initial stages until they can afford to have a professionally designed website. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that, Kevin. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's a good advice. Now, tell me, let's talk a little bit about the business. So mm -hmm. you have a design background. You've done that before. But I'm just going to guess that having running a business is new to you at this stage that we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's totally new. Um, like I said, I had worked for roughly two years in design firms. One of the design firms I worked at was a residential design firm, small uh, firm in Connecticut with about four people. Um, so from that, I was able to sort of glean some information on how a firm is run. My, my second and third job was at a 50 to 60 person commercial based firm in Boston. Um, and so, you know, all along it's sort of soaking in information, but really just sort of, uh, just doing a lot of research. There's a lot of free information online. Um, podcasts such as this, um, you know, to, to learn about how to run, run a business. Well, and and having having said that, Kevin, you know what are you know what what if you're sitting down with someone who's con contemplating starting their business, and you're the wise mentor who's gonna you know kind of give them a couple pieces of his advice. G give me give me something. Give me one one solid piece of advice. And let I'm just gonna mention last time you mentioned you know organizing your systems. This is in the first episode we did together, which would be episode 45. Don't be afraid of taking risks, putting yourself out there. 
and having a savings runway. But then in terms of actually running the business. Um, I would say definitely um, find something that differentiates you from your competitors, number one. I think that's important with any business. I think a lot of times architects sort of lean on, you know, my design is my differentiator. Um, but I don't know how much the general public can, can sense a difference between most designers, most good designers. Um, so I think trying to find something else uh, that makes you stick out um, is really important early on. And what have you guys used to stick out like that to position yourselves? Um, I would say one of the things was originally, I mean, we got our first job before we had even completed really anything of any sort of significant scale based on our mission statement. What is uh, that? Well, it was, it was, it was more of a, I guess, more of a, a paragraph or, you know, it was more than just a few words. We've refined it over the years, but basically the whole concept is that although we do single family homes, we approach it from an urban scale. Uh, we like to look at how it affects the greater neighborhood and what it's, what's around it and how do we keep Phoenix has, has a problem with always being new, uh, rather than sort of embracing the old. And we sort of said, you know, we like to honor the past, uh, while we do these designs. And, and this job was a 1950s home by, uh, Ralph Haver, who was a famous architect in Phoenix in the mid-century modern movement. Um, and they loved what we said about, you know, embracing the past and just and just making it uh, the plan and stuff livable for for what what they needed and what they needed now. So they just really were inspired by our vision um, and hired us almost purely based on that. Excellent. I have a question about business development, Kevin. So mm -hmm. do you get most of your leads? Are they just coming to you because of the sort of assets you've set up or do you have to do any active business development? I mean, I would say uh, the former more than the latter. Um, everything, I, I almost look at everything as business development. Everything that we do um, is constantly trying to develop the business, the kind of jobs that we do, you know, the persona that we put out there, how we're involved with the community. All of those things are business development, but they're all personal as well. I don't, it's hard to sort of separate the two. Um, but for the most part, most of our jobs have been one-offs, meaning they're not referral-based. Um, so we've gotten a lot of stuff online uh, through a bunch of different methods. Print publication, house.com has got, given us a lot of great stuff. Um, just uh, socializing with people and finding people who need work um, at events. Uh, getting work from contractors who have worked with us on other jobs and liked us and referred us to a client that they had gotten. Um, so a bunch of different uh, methods, really. Do you use any sort of co of uh, customer management software or project management software to manage the process currently? No. Okay. No. So and tell me about growing the business then and being strategic about where you want to go. Yeah, I mean, we've always – we try not to take projects, uh, you know, now that we have a pretty good business flow and we've been able to to make some money and, and support ourselves, we try to not take projects um, uh, that uh, will take up too much time that aren't in the direction that we're looking to go. In what direction um, is that? We like to do, I mean, it's pretty much at this point, single family housing. Uh, we like to stay in certain areas. We like to work with historic and mid-century homes. Um and then infill housing. So if it, if it's not in in those three sort of realms, we we generally aren't going to do it. And then we like to when we interview the clients, we're not just having them interview us. We're actually interviewing them in the process too, because we want to work with clients who see us more as um, having some some more value than just being a commodity to, to give them uh, plants. Uh, we don't want those kind of jobs. Uh, we don't see that as progressing our business. Those are all cash only, uh, really, those kind of jobs. And um, we like to have, you know, single family houses is such a personal thing. I mean, we get really attached to our clients that we want to be able to like them. And, that, and, that, and that's really important when you think about a four to six month process to be able to like someone. It's You don't want to be see a phone number on your phone and go, oh, 
they're calling. You know what I mean? You want to have that positive, like, oh yeah, I can't like to talk to them. And actually our first client that I mentioned is going to be uh, 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 marrying us at our ceremony in two months. So we get very close with our clients. We have great relationships with them. We've got clients who have had babies in the process. I mean, it's it's fantastic. And that's why I love residential architectures, having that connection and, and creating a sense of community within, you know, within work, um, creating value for them. They're creating value for you. And it's, it's a win-win situation. So. Yeah, I, I like the residential aspect for that for that reason, too. Absolutely. You talked mm -hmm. about in terms of business development, you said that there were some you like to get out there in community. That's one of the things you do mm -hmm. is you get involved. Give me some yeah, we, examples of some things you're involved in and, and which ones are more successful, shall we say, from a business standpoint? It's all sorts of things. Um, you know, uh, downtown Phoenix is having a pretty nice resurgence um, in terms of, you know, this great artist community and there's lots of events happening. And um, so we like to get involved in that sort of stuff. We get involved. We do a lot of uh, lecturing um, at, uh, we know, uh, Arizona State University, uh, Modern Phoenix Week, Arizona Preservation Foundation. Um, uh, for the city of Phoenix, we do stuff. Um, so we like to get out there and and present as an educational thing. Um, you know, less for us and more to be able to get out there and talk about the interest, interesting things that are going on in Phoenix and 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 how people can get involved in educating them along those aspects and in the process we get educated as well and we meet interesting people and and talk to them and and so that's really sort of how we do our community outreach yeah as well as you know facebook and those sort of things as well okay now i know a lot of architects have questions about how other other designers or architects structure their fees mm -hmm. how are you structuring your fees right now uh, typically there are lump sum fees, uh, that we base off of, we record all of our hours on our projects. And so in the beginning, we were kind of just guessing. Now we have information on roughly how long certain projects take us. Um, so we, we have a hourly number that's constantly changing based on our expertise and, and, you know, and the economy, but we take that number and we multiply by how many hours we think we're going to spend on the project. And we provide a lump sum, which is then broken down through the process of existing conditions, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and so okay. forth. So that's okay. how we typically bill. Okay. And what's an average hourly rate that you try to shoot for? Around 100. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then you take that project budget. You're able to look back. So the first couple of projects that you did, you had no idea about how long it was going to take. Do you have an mm -hmm. idea how much were you earning on an hourly rate if you had to break it down on those projects? Some of the early projects, I mean, we were probably at 25 an hour. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it's hard to say each project kind of differs. And we've had projects even, you know, within the last year that we've kind of missed, missed on. But, I mean, we're always making money. We have very little overhead. We work from home. You know, most of our stuff is online. We, you know, we don't have a plotter or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, we do most of our stuff digitally. We have our meetings. We don't print out much paper. We use, you know, our iPad and that kind of stuff um, to, to show our work and, you know, do a lot of emailing and stuff online. So all that, most of that information is, is, is free uh, or those, those communication uh, areas are free. So that's awesome. So you're definitely leveraging the digital tools of our, yeah, they're huge. Too. I mean, we use, we use Gmail and Google calendar and all that kind of stuff for our basic uh, we even use uh, Google Drive to share uh, spreadsheets when we're going through, you know, fixtures and finishes and that kind of stuff where we are constantly updating it and the clients can update it as well. If they find something they like, they can put it in a different color. Uh, we use Google Hangouts. We have some clients who are in different states. Some, uh, you know, we did a project in Florida for a family member. We have clients in Indiana who are moving here. Uh, in which we do Google Hangouts, in which we can talk just like this, but we can also bring our screen up and you know fly them around digitally through the model. Um, so we 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 leverage all of those things. Excellent. Now let's talk project scope a little bit. Kind of what is your average? Just give me an example of. I'm trying to get an idea for how much these projects, how how long they might take to do. And when we're talking the hours, um, mm -hmm. you know, give me an average project out there, and just kind of let me know how much time an average project would take you to do. What goes into it? Yeah, I mean, our projects, fortunately, have been changing about every quarter or so. We've been getting larger and larger projects. 
So, I mean, last year we, we did a lot of projects. I think we did 35 projects last year. It's just myself and Claire. Wow. Um, so, I mean, we were really busy and doing a lot of work, but some of them were as small as bathrooms, you know, uh, as, and then as large as, you know, um, additions and remodels. Uh, we've just started to do some new build houses. Um, so I would say right now our projects are taking, uh, we can do probably four to six, you know, complete renovations slash new builds where the construction budget is probably 200 to 500,000. We can do about four to six of those at a time and they probably take four months or so. Um, so that's, I mean, but then like last year was completely different. We were doing a lot of smaller, a lot of smaller projects. So it's changing. And we've recently hired on another designer to, to do some projects for us as well. Yeah. And how long would it take in terms of man hours for you and Claire to deliver one of those projects? Generally speaking, um, I would say probably, uh, 150 to 250 hours. Okay. It's probably what we're looking at for most of the, the projects. Awesome. And in a general week, how much percentage would you say of your time is spent doing the work versus doing other administrative tasks or business development tasks? Well, the great thing about our partnership is is Claire handles most of the uh, administrative uh, business end of stuff, and I handle most of the design and marketing end of stuff. Um, so it's split pretty evenly. So I would say most of my time, I probably do probably most weeks are probably around 50 hour weeks. Um, you know, not too crazy, but, um, I probably do 40 hours of pure architecture based work and 10 hours of, you know, emails, Facebook, Twitter, website updates, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Gotcha. So, and how many projects, you gave me an idea of about four-month time period, but how many projects, I mean, can you realistically handle at your current size on like a monthly basis? How many would you have going at one time? Um, well, those four to six projects that take over four months, they'd all be going on at the same time. Yeah. Um, so that would probably, be, that's just my personal max as a designer. And that's why we've hired on another designer who's working on, I think, three or four projects right now. And those are projects in design. We also have projects in construction, which I'll swing by the site and answer phone calls and that kind of stuff as well. So it ranges. I mean, we've had months where we've had probably 10 to 15 projects at once. And then we've had months where it's maybe one or two projects that are larger projects. So it kind of, it changes. Okay. You have a lot going on. There's yeah. uh, obviously architecture is a, or design, shall we say, is a complex profession. And how do you manage your time? What strategies have you found to be useful for making sure you get done what you need to get done in a week? Um, hmm. I mean, I don't really think about how I'm going to manage my time. I, I think it's just something ingrained from architecture school that you just, you're usually working. Um, and then you just, you know, stop when you need to stop. So I, there's nothing really that's like, I have to set an hourly schedule or something like that. We have, milestones for each of our projects like okay we want to have schematic design done by now so i constantly looking at the calendar and that sort of thing for long-term projections but in terms of a day-to-day -day, the nice thing about working for yourself is it's, it's almost more inspiration based so if i'm if i'm thinking about a certain project you know maybe i'll spend six hours that day working on that project but i won't work on it for another two days so it's really um more about the quality of the time than the quantity of time. It's just really getting into things. And then we do try to make things easy where if we're in design development on multiple projects at the same time, we'll go, let's say, to the tile store and we'll do all three projects at the same time. We'll, we'll get all of our samples and acquire that all at the same time. So we're not going out on back and forth, back and forth. Um, so I guess that's sort of a time management strategy. But um, otherwise, yeah, it's just sort of, just wake up in the morning and go to work kind of thing. Excellent. So you've currently, you're currently have some staff you've hired on another designer who's helping you get some of the work done. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's the plan for the future? Well, first of all, let me ask, are you currently doing design build work? Um, kind of a one project, but mostly it's design bid build. Um, we're trying, we're not involved with the build of any projects right now. Uh, we have a more flexible arrangement on one of our jobs right now where it's kind of a 
because of the fact it's a renovation of a house that's very intricate and unique, it's sort of going through the process together and planning out a little bit at a time rather than a huge master plan because things would change based on the intricacy of the existing house. Um, but for the most part, we do the first schematic and design development, and then we get a contractor involved uh, during construction documents. Okay. And where would you like to take your business long term? What's the plan for the future with the the ranch mine? And before you answer that question, Kevin, there's actually one other question I want to ask you. The ranch sure. mine is an interesting name. Some people might be wondering why that name. Tell us. Yeah, great question. Um, so when we were thinking of a a name for the business back in uh, 2010 when we founded the LLC. Um, we had done a lot of research because we were both unemployed at the time. We did a lot of research on, you know, what made Arizona interesting. Um, so we would go to some of the ghost towns and some of the mines and, you know, some of the ranches and that sort of thing. And uh, we just thought Arizona had such a unique history that's so unexplored and forgotten about by, you know, most of the United States is great because Claire is actually a native of Phoenix. There's not many of those, but she is a native of Phoenix and I'm from, you know, Connecticut, complete opposite. And so I'm learning all these new things and, and she's even learning more about the history of Arizona. And so we wanted to incorporate that into our design name. We didn't want to do, you know, uh, Kevin and Claire design lab or something like that. We wanted it to be native to the place that we were. So, that's where we came up with the ranch mines. Ranching and mining were two of the biggest industries that made Arizona possible. Um, and then we looked at it from a sort of elevated urban perspective that Phoenix itself is a ranch mine in which there's all these ranch houses. You know, in 1950 to 1960, I believe it's roughly 100,000 ranch houses were built in Phoenix in just a decade because it blew up after the post-war, you know, when people were moving here in, in droves. So. Phoenix has so much potential in these very simple housing stock um, that are, are decently well built, but just, and they're in a very central location. Um, so that's sort of both versions of, of why we came up with that name. Excellent. Thank you for that. And so now the future of the ranch mine, what's, what's your long-term goal here? Um, Long term, I guess it's kind of relative. Um, we, we don't like to project too far out because we want to be adaptable to the changing economy and the state of things. Um, but uh, we love to do housing. Housing is you know what we do. I personally, right now, I have all my IDP hours done. I'm looking to probably take the, the exams after we get married in April. And um, so I guess the right now we're working with a good mixture of developers and uh, custom clients. And we like to keep an even mix of those roughly um, then because they both have their pros and cons. And so for the, I guess the long term, we'd like to do uh, continue that sort of ratio of roughly 50, 50 developer versus custom client projects um, and continue to build those relationships. Um, and then hopefully do a little bit more of sort of, uh, multifamily, small multifamily projects as well. Um, but mostly again in, in the, in the housing industry. Sure. When you have a new project come in the door, what criteria do you look at when you look at that project and say, okay, strategically, you know, is this project going to help move our business in the direction we want it to go? Well, the first and most important thing is the relationship with the client or the developer. Um, if you if you don't get along, it's not going to be a good project. Uh, no matter how much money's thrown at it or anything, that none of that stuff matters if you can't get along and you don't like the people. So first thing we do is we meet with the people and make sure that we have a good rapport. Um, the second thing is we try to look for projects that can provide something unique and interesting that maybe we haven't done before. I think a lot of people when they're developing their businesses try to create something that they can churn out in a sort of industrial type of uh, thing because they, they feel that, oh, I can get better and better at something as it goes along. Our philosophy is a bit different. We always want to find something new and different to learn something new every time. Um, and I think what it does is it, it creates sort of almost an evolutionary form of our business in which because we're diversified, we're able to adapt better to what the the current state of the market is. You know, if we did all worked with all developers at one point and then that market goes, 
what do we do from there? Or if we work with all custom clients and that market goes, what do I do for this? So we'd like to have different kind of clients. We like to have different kind of projects and we like to have something that's unique and different about each one. And whether that's the existing structure or something unique and different that we haven't worked with, or, you know, we're working on a project where we're doing an addition built out of Adobe, you know, trying new building typologies, you know, trying to find something new and interesting each time. So we look at it almost academically in terms of, okay, how can we learn and build our portfolio so that we're better at everything, you know, as we're moving forward and then we can pick and choose what we've worked with. Um, and then how do we work in unique clients and developer visions as well? You know, each client has a different life story and that kind of thing. So we look for interesting things about clients, um, because we like to work those into, uh, the designs of the houses. Yeah. Kevin, I've, I'm thinking of the quote, no man is an island. And I'd like to ask you what resources along the way have been helpful for you in being successful in business? Yeah, it's a, that's a great quote. I mean, um, I mean, there's so many, my, um, I mean, it starts early on. Uh, my father was an engineer, um, and he built my, the house that I grew up in, um, uh, you know, by himself, he designed it and did a lot of the work and he was the general contractor for it while working a full-time job, which seems crazy at this point and, and raising my older brother. Um, so I think, you know, you know, that kind of work ethic and sort of, um, growing up in a house that was unique and i mean he was really into energy efficiency this is back in the early 80s i guess you know kind of ahead of the green movement that is now um you know i had a you know a bill once we had to bring in our energy bills to to class in math to talk about you know i think it was multiplication tables or something and the teacher thought i was lying about how much money we spent on energy because it was so low kind of thing. so I, you know that sort of thing I mean, he got me really interested in that sort of aspect growing up. And that's what inspired me, I think, to become an architect um, or almost an architect. Uh, so that was huge. I had a professor in college who introduced me to uh, the great work being done out here in Phoenix. You know, Will Bruder and Wendell Burnett. I mean, Phoenix is one of those places that there's a lot of sprawl and sort of stucco houses that when you look at the big vision, people don't think it's exciting, but some of the unique modern architecture is like nowhere else in the world because of the desert environment. There's some really interesting, I mean, you look, have, I don't know, have you ever been to Phoenix? I have, you bet. Yeah. Have you been to the public library downtown? I've driven right by it. I haven't gone inside of it yet. Though. I mean, it is spectacular and it, and it's like no other, you know, coming from a place like Boston, it's like it's nothing else you'd ever see. And there's some yeah. really interesting stuff. So uh, my professor for, um, you know, showing me and revealing these things I didn't even know existed. I think that's, that was huge. Um, working at those two firms in college, you know, as much experience as you can get before you get out of college in terms of one gaining, you know, basic experience in college, they don't really teach you much about construction documents or code or zoning or that kind of stuff. Um, so learning all that information or, you know, at least getting acquainted with it earlier on is just uh, invaluable, I think. Um, and then of course, um, meeting my partner, Claire, and then her father and being able to have that opportunity. Um, you know, whenever you get an opportunity, just try to make the most of it. Um, and then here, you know, just meeting people, there was a, there's an architect, Taz Lumens, who, um, she writes a blog and, uh, called Blooming Rock. And, uh, she recently moved to Portland, but, um, I met with her early on and she was instrumental. I did that film bar project with her. Um, as a registered architect, you know, just having someone to talk to and, and learn and stuff from in terms of a professional sort of standpoint, as well as, um, you know, just simple stuff here and there. Um, and then, you know, just, um, the internet in general, I mean, there's just so much information that if you want to learn, you can learn pretty much anything. Yeah. Is there um, any, any, any online sites that come to mind besides business of architecture, of course? I mean, yeah, that's number one. Um, uh, Entrepreneur Architect, uh, Mark LePage, is, is a fantastic resource. Um, I like TED Talks. Um, there's a guy, uh, I think uh, Rory Sutherland, uh, who's a, uh, I think he's an economist or something, but very interesting sort of philosophy on, on, uh, on value, which is something that we like to talk about a lot in our business. Um, Seth Godin the author um, and public speaker, I guess. 
on marketing and that type of stuff. So you can kind of learn bits and pieces um, through, you know, reading a uh, public library, um, but as well as, you know, finding blogs and that sort of stuff online. Excellent. Kevin, it's, yeah. it's been great having you on the show. Yeah, it's and, been great. Uh, look forward to the much continued success for your business. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the business of architecture. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.